are the four representatives for force design. So we have four recommendations. The first is a long-term force design structure recommendation. The second is answering the question that was posed to us about where we can invest and divest. The third is about networks and how they can control seabed to space for force design. And then lastly, a short-term recommendation on where we most need that force design employment. So where does it all start? It starts with war fighting. That is the number one priority being pushed down from force leaders to the unit commanders. And we need to do the same with force design because if we do not have the right capabilities being delivered at the speed of relevancy, then it's very likely we will not win the next large scale conflict or in the worst case, we might not even get there. The elephant in the room though is that in the midst of aging infrastructure and consistent shipyard delays, that over the next two plus decades, war fighting demands iterative or iterative force design. Uh, so war fighting, simply put, equals force design. And in order to execute that, we need the, the proper employment of people. So war fighting equals force design, also equals talent management. It's like the CNO's topics of people, ideas, things. People come first to execute the ideas. The things are really the last bit. So in order to facilitate that sustained culture of the lowest level force design ownership, we propose an office of force design in the spirit of N7, but with a different executing muscle. So respectfully, the folks that are at the, the top of the Joint Chiefs of Staff aren't really the enforcers and iterators of force design. Just as E5s are the backbones to ships, we propose that you should have the O3 to O5 um, members of the fleet who should be PCS to this Office of Force Design and, and own its execution. So we'll draw them from across unrestricted line and support communities, particularly those who are intimately familiar with contemporary delivery environments. So for example, that would be the 60% of at-sea submariners who are going to spend time in the shipyard over the next 10 years. For those folks, being at the Office of Force Design could be considered a milestone tour particularly if they're going to be selected in the future as executive officers or commanding officers for delivering assets from construction environments to the fleet. The target audience, however, though, are those lowest level unit commanders and squadrons and battalions where they would have sailors and Marines with AQDs of force design or collateral duty of force design that provides timely, relevant, contextualized feedback from the deck plate up to this Office of Force Design and ultimately to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. This is a way that we can help prevent gaps in fleet capabilities by making sure that these folks are communicating the barriers to getting the assets that we most need. While the Office of Force Design could do activities like acquisition shark tanks from sailors and Marines or run more frequent JO symposiums, the key to all of that activity is pushing the authority down for force design to the next generation of force leadership who can then cut through the acquisitions processes and PPBE processes and fight the siloing that you have between inter-service agencies and instead communicate real priorities to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Operational warfighters today can't just rely on at-sea performance. They have to be executors of force design and maintenance availabilities and delivery timelines. After 2019, in this event, this DARE symposium, the USMC created a talent management strategy group, and that was to keep up the drumbeat on talent management. We want to channel that ethos as well for force design with this institution. So we're imploring you, allow us and the folks that are at our level to be that disruptive force for force design and to provide a sustained feedback loop to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, even after individual service chiefs retire. So Andrew did a great job there of uh, really talking about the long-term solution, uh, what, we, what we see going forward for, for the next fight. But really, sir, the, the question that was posed was more about the investments and divestments. So this portion of it is really going to get out the meat and potatoes of the question that you posed for this forum. And so a direct question deserves a direct answer. So right here we have listed uh, divestments and investments for you. Just like to note that these are just for consideration. It's not necessary binary. You don't really have to take this to fund the other, but it is suggestions that we have from the various specialties that were here throughout the entire forum. 
I'm only going to hit on a couple right here. These are the tangible ones that we have. Now, uh, Seaplanes right here, it's a multi-domain platform that we're looking at. We used it um, throughout. We had squadrons throughout World War II, and we even see our allies and partners using Seaplanes today. Um, the reason we only run away from seaplanes within the Navy is in the 1980s we went away from them because we didn't see any type of conflict in the Pacific for the future. But we see that today and we see it as being a multi-domain platform that can absolutely support distributed maritime operations. I get the question often about why not just rotary wing. We have rotary wing helicopters to do many of the sustainment uh, casualty evacuation. But the fact of the matter is that rotary wing cannot land on the sea. It has um, a further range than Rotary Wing as well. And just to, you know, just a, an example that most of us know is the USS Indianapolis and how they were able to your, uh, land, pull people from the ocean, and ships were still a day and a half away from going and collecting these individuals, these sailors from the water. And so we can't do that with Rotary Wing, even if they find them. We need to be able to pull them immediately. The other item, too, with seaplanes is that uh, it's a very much a concern for many for sustainment and logistics, and we believe that this is the type of platform that can support us due to that longer range. Moving down to the second example, we have our expeditionary medical facilities. This is a 13-acre platform that is obviously based on land due to how large it is, but it really is something that should be dispersed or broken down into expeditionary damage resuscitative care or expeditionary resuscitative uh, surgical systems. Now we have ERSSs now and we're looking at expanding them, but we really need to start looking at how can we have more and consider the rotation of forces and consider that medical is not immune to being wounded, ill, injured, or a KIA themselves. And so we need to really backfill those and look at those for this huge AOR that we have in the maritime domain. The expeditionary medical facility, the question then can be posed, well, what will we have, uh, what a high capacity item can we have? But really when you look on land, you look at the Air Force and the Army creating these roll three medical units that we can bring our forces to. And these uh, expeditionary resuscitative or surgical systems that we can grow and have out there really to be with the warfighter and with the sailor in the maritime domain. Now, although your question, though, is very much direct in divestments and investments, we also looked at opportunity cost. So we look at, we want to make sure that we're investing in the people as well and that we're not forgetting about, uh, we want to almost remove those sunk costs as well. So one item that we're going to hit on here is the homegrown cyber officers that normally come from the line side. And we're looking at uh, proposing a direct commission for the cyber domain. And that would be very similar to the medical corps, medical service corps uh, that we have there, which is a staff corps. So we can go out, we can um, recruit direct, and they will immediately become cyber officers. And then rather than being on the line side and potentially being uh, tagged to be a commanding officer of a ship, or, uh, or any other type of a platform, these cyber officers will really be the leader in their domain and they can focus on cyber because we know that cyber and AI is the future and we need to take steps forward to get these people in as soon as possible. The final item I'm gonna hit on are, is this uh, homegrown programs or starting from scratch mindset. And I like to call it the American mindset. The military, the American military very much likes to be the leader in all domains and we look at it and our allies and partners can follow us and see what we're doing and tag on to it because we like to be the innovators. But the fact of the matter is that the, that mindset negates what our allies and partners are doing. And so they may have a platform that's perfect that we need to inject into our own military and then it takes away that sunk cost of always um, building something from scratch and having that type of a platform that only we have and then we hope that others will gain. An example from that, going back to the seaplanes, is the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force. They have the US-2 seaplane. And it, it's, it's a squadron there that they use for search and rescue. It can uh, you know, support casualty evacuation. It supports sustainment and logistics today. And we know that it works. We know that it functions well. 
Now, during the presentation, the original presentation, the question was posed by the CNO of, well, you know, Congress likes having things homegrown. That's how they want to move forward. And I understand that that can be a constraint when it comes to how we build our military. So I added on that I think it's interesting that we never see our allies and partners come and do a deployment to the United States. We never see a squadron of the US-2 come to the United States for six months at a time. We incorporate them into our operations. We train with them long term within the United States. And we use that as an example of how it's working and what's working. And then now that, that can feed in so that maybe we can make that argument of we do need to invest in having this type of platform within the American military. And the final item here too is uh, with cyber, but I'm gonna be passing this off to Jordan who's gonna delve deeper into the cyber platform. And yes, so as Jessica mentioned, um, that we need to invest more into our cyber community. Um, in 1967, the USS Forrestal um, caught fire and it shifted the entire damage control for the entire fleet. Um, now every sailor is a damage control man. I would make the argument that everyone needs to now be a cyber defender. Um, I have the luxury of receiving my information warfare pin. However, that is no longer eligible for non-IT or non-cyber rates. And I think that is a disservice to the fleet and to uh, America due to, there was, when I received my pin, there was a lot of information I did not know about the cyber community. But when I received my pin and had to go through the, uh, the churn uh, and get my PQS signed, there was a lot of information that I learned and that um, I take with me or I use to this day. Um, in 1920, the war game for War Plan Orange was being conducted consistently um, throughout that time in preparation for whatever conflict um, that was coming, and that was World War II, and we were successful in that. And I would say that we need to have a modern day war plan. Um, that, water, that modern day war plan looks like a mobilization of a training team that would go to senior leadership, specifically 06s, 05s, or, the, or even at the flag level, um, there would be a tabletop exercise or a tabletop discussion, brown bag lunch, whatever it may be. Um, that personnel would sit down, they discuss different things. Hey, what would you do if you didn't have comms? What would you do if you had comms? And we kind of just communicate and see what everyone's thinking. And the idea behind this is not to necessarily um, use or think about the technology that we have and how can we use it. There's also an aspect of it that we need to understand that if we did not have controls, what would we do? And because of we have this chemistry that we're building um, at the 06, 05 and flag level, it builds this initiative um, to operate in an environment where you do not have any um, C2. Additionally, I think it would be wise for us to utilize our ITs to train the fleet. This would um, attack more of the 04 and below. Um, personnel so that there's a understanding and a culture that's being built that the IT or cyber community, cyber culture um, is embedded within the United States Navy. Um, the goal of this, um, it would reduce reliance on networking event of a hack and it would produce low threat initiate, sorry, it would produce low level initiative needed to win wars. Both of these increasing our defense and deci decision advantage. And now I'll pass it off to Jack. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, as we talked about force design, it became readily apparent that force design has a lot of different aspects to it, starting with the largest and going down to the smallest. And what we organically came up with was that the, the smallest element of force design is actually force employment. What are we doing with our forces today that equip us for tomorrow, for the next day, and for 10 years down the road? So we talked about the Navy, Coast Guard, and Marine Corps' current assets and how they can best be utilized and capitalized on, divested and, in invest, and invested in, in order to best equip us. Our first thought was um, manning, training, and sustainability. And that all comes in the base model of the assets that we know we can, that we know we can operate today. So we talked about the DDG, patrol boats, both Coast Guard and Navy, amphibious aircraft, and submarines. The base models that we can put people on today, train them on, and they can become brilliant at the basics for the near future and far future. By creating these structures where people can excel, we enable ourselves to be, um, cut, sorry. <laughs> I, only, I only had it in me once, guys. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> okay. 
By creating these platforms, these base models, we enable the forces to surge on demand. We can pull people from every aspect of our service, land or sea, to operate where they do best because we have the numbers. Additionally, we can scale our forces. So when we have the members who can be brought into the fight quickly, we enable ourselves to fight today, fight tomorrow, and be prepared to fight in 10 years without being caught off guard. From there, that base model serves as a platform to then expand upon. We can incorporate a bolt-on, bolt-off method of procurement, including primarily technology, but going far into the future, we know that we don't operate at the speed of industry. So instead, we create the base and we expand as industry expands as well. As well. With that, as a Coastie, my experience comes from time on a national security cutter where we could get underway with the Scan Eagle 2.0 tomorrow, and on our next patrol, we get underway with the Scan Eagle 3.0. This allows us to move at industry speed rather than military procurement speed. With that, we project ourselves to the future using what we currently have and allow ourselves to divest manpower and money from the assets that we do not see succeeding in our current area of operations. With that, we've completed force design from top to bottom and would like to offer up the floor to our next group.